Well, good morning. We are here for the final Board of Commissioners meeting in 2019. It's a decade thing. Yeah, the final in the decade as well. It'd be nice if we really we'll, did it perfect. We'll get a chance to talk about that, um, um, about the decade and, and other things, but we are here for our final meeting. It is Tuesday, December 31st, 2019. And notice it's a Tuesday, not a Wednesday, um, because we needed to have this before the holiday. We're here at 9 a.m. in the Senator hearing room uh, at 555 Court Street, Northeast Salem, Oregon. Pretty close to perfection at the end of the year. All right. One of the things we love to do um, is to always open our board sessions with the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you will join us. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kind of, you know, we didn't have a board session last week, and, and uh, over the last, the holiday, over Christmas, I watched uh, that Netflix, World War II in color, and I was just saying the Pledge of Allegiance, and it just, it was just like, flashbacks of the sacrifices that were made um, for us to be able to be here and do what we do um, in this democracy, in this representative democracy. Republic. And republic. Uh, well, that's what it's called, and it's a representative <laughs> democracy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and driving down, I came down the canyon this morning, I was just having some really um, pretty emotional thoughts emotional. about, yeah, this being the last day of the year and the decade, and we can talk more at the end, but I think we have some business we need to take care of before we... I want to talk about Pledge of Allegiance first. Just okay. so I can tell you something yeah. I've always done. I don't know why I want to confess this, but I always thought of it as, as close to a prayer as we can mm -hmm. have, and I like that. But I always concentrate on one star and make that Oregon and just think about that as I'm saying it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not always happy, just so you know, as different things go on. But mm -hmm. Just so you know what I'm doing. Probably should have waited a year to tell you that, but now you know. We were driving back from my parents' house after Christmas, and my four-year-old asked if we could say the Pledge of Allegiance on the drive home. How do you stand up? That's, that's when I knew, that's when I knew that <laughs> it was the best Christmas ever. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Well, is it the star that hangs out on the left? I just pick one. <laughs> just pick one. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a pretty awesome thing that we get to do that. And uh, <clears throat> those that have come before us that made the sacrifices that allow us to do this work uh, and represent the citizens of Marion County and, and the state of Oregon, um, it's a pretty humbling um, place to be. So with that, why don't, whose turn is it for the well, consent calendar? We've discussed it. Commissioner was uh, suggesting that it was mine. Okay. And that if I disagreed, the, he the had in, plenty of arguments to win. The incoming chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so Mr. Chair, with that, I will move that we adopt the consent agenda under Board of Commissioners, approve a resolution appointing Jan Fritz as the county's representative to the Courthouse Square Condominium Association and a memorandum of action electing Jan Fritz and Alan Pollock as directors, effective January 1st, 2020. Under business services, approve a recommendation to change titles, update language, and adjust upward the pay scale for classification number 306, civil engineering supervisor, and number 357, civil engineering associate three. Uphold the pay grade for number 305, civil engineering associate one, and number 353, civil engineering associate two. Under finance, approve amendment number four to the franchise extension agreement with wave division seven LLC DBA Wave Broadband, extending the agreement through June 30th, 2020, to allow for continued negotiations. Under Health and Human Services, approve amendment number five to the Intergovernmental Agreement with the Oregon Health Authority to add $39,902 for a total of $2,941,918 to provide basic public health services and for maintaining and improving public health services and programs in Marion County. Second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Our first item under action is Board of Commissioners. Consider approval of an order adopting revised administrative policy 301 equal 
employment opportunity. And Lisa. Good morning. Welcome. Lisa Traurnick from the board's office, and I have Salvador Jarenas here from uh, our HR um, group, and we're going to be talking about the policy revisions. We have a couple policies on the agenda this morning, and Salvador is here um, to talk about the training that he does in the um, county about these, around these um, policies. So the first one is policy 301, equal employment opportunity. And we have a regular review process that we go through with policies. Um, they're on a three-year schedule. Some of them are still in the catch-up mode. But um, this policy was updated just as part of the regular review process. And what that is is we look at the policy, we look at um, what our comparator counties are doing, and then some other local jurisdictions um, to make sure that we're following best practices. We look at the law. We consult with our legal counsel. Um, we talk to our central services departments, which are IT, legal, board's office, business services, and finance to make sure that they're all on board with our policies since they are administrative policies. And then um, we, we review them with the board of commissioners and um, we send them to the unions for review. Um, so this policy um, has gone through all of those steps and essentially this policy was pretty old. Um, we always follow the law, so even if our policies aren't updated, you know, immediately where our rules are that we follow state and federal law. So um, we always are in compliant and we always want our policies to be compliant too. So this is where the updates come. Um, the policy 301, essentially the two changes were, um, well there were three changes, formatting. Um, since it was an old policy, it needed some big formatting updates to um, be in line with our current policy structure. And then um, the purpose section and general policy statements are new. Um, other than that, the, it was pretty much was compliant and it just needed some updating language. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Salvador can answer any questions or is there anything that you'd like to add? Welcome, Salvador, if you have anything to add to that. You have anything to add to that? Um, our, our approach to dissemination of the policy at once approved um, there will be a communication countrywide, countywide, um, at, to, to all employees. Um, we will post the notice of right uh, based on this revised policy in all Bolton boards for the county. Uh, we will be communicating uh, and discussing the policy in length uh, in a couple of days with the whole department heads and elected officials meeting. Uh, we have uh, shared the, the draft of these policies with our labor organizations, uh, and our plan is to communicate uh, the policy on our new employee orientation per the policy um, coming up on this, this, this Friday. Uh, and we'll be available to conduct trainings uh, to all departments uh, in individual groups or, or meetings as, as requested. Okay. Any questions? No, I don't. Uh, are we going to take all three of these in one motion, or do we need to do them uh, in separate motions? I have motions? two different orders. 301 is an order, and then 602, policy 602. Um, they're separate policies. I can talk okay. about them both now. I mean, we can, up to you. Uh, so you just did 301. 301. That's yes. good. We'll go ahead and finish it, and then you can go into 602. So we need a motion. Fine. I'd make a motion. We do approve an order that adopts revised administration. Administrative Policy 301, Equal Employment Opportunity. And I'll second the motion. Okay, motion and second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. And we'll go on to consider approval of an order adopting revised administrative policy 602, discrimination and harassment free workplace. Great. Welcome again. Thank you. Uh, so before you is um, updated policy 602, discrimination and ha harassment free workplace um, for your consideration. That is a new title. The previous title was non-discrimination. Um, and so we included, we, we made the title more um, telling of what the policy is. Um, we have other policies that have similar titles and so we kind of went along those same lines. Um, again, this policy was reviewed as part of the regular review process. It has been reviewed by the, well, the unions had the opportunity to review it. We've gone through the Board of Commissioners, Central Services, 
legal has looked at it. But one of the big things about this policy is there are some new employment laws that go into effect tomorrow, um, state employment laws, and so we needed to make sure that our policy had in it the things um, required by the new law. We had a really robust policy already, which was helpful. Um, and actually, in looking at other jurisdictions, ours stood out as a really good policy. So we just needed to include some of those specifics of the new law. And some of those things um, are when and how employees are notified of their rights. So there are, um, there's specific language in the policy about that. Protections for pregnant employees. Previously, it was just um, um, now there's accommodation protections for pre, uh, pregnant employees that weren't previously there. Um, there's a new statute of limitations on filing discrimination or harassment claims. Record keeping related to claims is in the new law and then also um, follow up with complainants for a year following an investigation. So these are some things that are going to impact our supervisors and our departments and um, this was where um, Salvador and the other HR business analysts come into play because they actually do a lot of training on this policy and um, they have incorporated these new um, guidelines into the training they're doing. And I can, Salvador can talk about that. Um, at the back of the packet is the workplace accommodation notice, which is also new. Um, that's um, basically related to pregnancy and um, medical conditions around pregnancy and allowing accommodation. And that's something that now has to be posted in all of our workplaces um, and given out to employees. So all employees will receive these policies today um, and that notice and then um, HR going forward will work on making sure that things are updated as far as notifications um, if anything changes there. Um, I think that's it for me unless you have any questions. Salvador, did you want to add anything about your training that you're doing? No, probably not. It's the same strategy of dissemination. Okay. Comments? Well, I, I actually got to see Salvador's training at the health department when I was doing the service award, and he did a very, very nice job. So thank you for your work. Thank you know, that uh, takes a lot of work to prepare those presentations, and uh, there's a lot of information that you're having to uh, get to a lot of people. I know um, in my previous life, I practiced law, and nothing like trying to describe a statute to 100 people and keep them all awake. Yeah. So. You did a great job. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's important we keep up on these things. In fact, I think I started some training online <laughs> that I haven't finished yet. That's supposed to be due today or you something. Better get on that. We do. <laughs> I, I just remembered I was working. I was working on the training online. I think like ten days ago, and I got sidetracked and shut it down. And I think I didn't finish it. I will get it done. In fact, I'll do it while we're working here. Right. No, I won't. <laughs> I won't do it. All right, better Thank you for your work. Thing we'll take a motion. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve an order adopting revised administrative policy number 602, discrimination and harassment free workplace. Second. A motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Item number three. Thank Consider you. approval of an order establishing Marion County Human Resources Department <clears throat> effective July 1st, 2020. Jan Fritz, our Chief Administrative Officer. Good morning, Commissioners. For the record, I'm Jan Fritz, Chief Administrative Officer, Marion County. The item before you today is a board order establishing a new Human Resources Department in Marion County. For a little background, in 1998, the county consolidated several departments and moved them into one department now known as Business Services. However, as the complexity of the laws, the accounting standards changed in 2006, we pulled out finance and created a finance department and hired a chief financial officer. So now the same thing's happening with HR. We have 15 departments, we have over 1,700 full and part-time employees, and the complexity of the laws and all the stuff that Lisa was describing earlier um, require an HR department. So when I first became the CAO in July, and with full support of the board, I announced we were going to create a new HR department. So thank you very much. I think it's really critical to the county that we have one. Um, and since that time, we've had a dedicated team from finance, HR, 
and IT putting together the technical structure of the new department in the Oracle system, in the financial records, the accounting records, the budget records, the HR hierarchy. And so there's been a lot of time spent doing that. We've created a job classification for the chief human resource officer, and we've gone out for recruitment. And we're in the final process of that. Next Friday, we have final interviews with the commissioners um, to select the chief human resource officer. Um, so once on board, the director will be able to participate in the budget process as well as help transition the new department um, leading up to fiscal year 2021, which would be July 1st and the fiscal year for the budget, so they'll be able to participate there. So in order to better meet the needs of our growing workforce and the county, I encourage you to adopt the board order establishing a human resources department in Marion County's organizational structure, effective July 1st, 2020. Okay. Comments? I, I just want to say thank you, Jan, for your leadership on this. This was something that right after uh, we voted to appoint you as CAO, <laughs> you said this has to happen. This is vital for the county. And uh, I just appreciate your ability to know that and to be uh, sort of very convicted and firm in your leadership that th this is a priority for the county. And um, I just really appreciate that. Thank you. I truly believe that. Commissioner, you have anything? Well, I do, but she, Jan just pretty well went over. I was trying to write down my ideas real fast. Like if I could read my own writing, I'd, I'd read it, but I think it's how I feel. I, because of the complexity of the issue, the importance and vulnerability to the county, both financially, but also in terms of morale and efficiency, it's important to raise the status of, the human, of our human resources efforts, and I think this does that. Yeah, you know, and, and I think uh, you you can relate to this. I know I certainly can as a as a business person. There's no more important asset than the people you have uh, in in the county. It's no different than people that 1,700 employees that we have that uh, uh, are out there serving um, uh, either one another in some way or the citizens uh, direct. And I always say this in employee orientation that um, most of us in this room are the only place that somebody can go to get what they need. If it's a DA or if it's a sheriff or if, it, you know, even IT serving the other person, it's not like you can go out and get another IT person to, to help you that day. And so if you're, the, if you're the only person, especially in government, where people can go to get that service, public works, building permits, then why would we not want to be the best at it? And I think having a strong HR department that helps uh, recognize that in, in each one of our employees, recognizes the number one on each person's forehead, said, because we all have talents that we need to shine and allow to shine, and having an HR department that will bring that out, help support our, our uh, 1,700 employees to be the best that they can be is extremely important. So I think it was a good move, strategic move, uh, Jan, and, and uh, thank you very much for doing this we still got a lot of work to go yes we do a lot of work to do it but that's what i love about marion county and the the people that work here is that we're not afraid of a a, a big challenge and take it on and, and make it happen anything else if there's not chair camera i'd make a motion that we do approve the order that establishes marion county human resources department effective july 1st 2020 and i'll second the motion i have a motion and a second <clears throat> any further discussion Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right, Thank motion you, passes. Thank you. Okay, our next topic is under business services. Consider approval of contract for services with Brown and Brown Northwest in the amount of $703,694.10 to provide insurance broker and consulting services through December 31st, 2024. And Justine is here to present that to us. Good morning. I'm Justine Flora, the manager for both risk and benefits here at Marion County. And the, as you mentioned, we're going to talk about the um, contract for the broker and consultant services. Um, this contract is actually awarded in two sections. So um, 
We utilize currently Brown & Brown as our both broker and consultant for the employee benefits and the property casualty portions of the department. Um, so they, and both, both sides of their service are twofold. <coughs> So they act as brokers for the insurances, so things like the health plan and um, life and disability and all of those insurances that we have through the employee benefits program, as well as on uh, consultants. So when I come to you in the fall and we were talking about benefit plan renewals and and all that fun stuff with all those wonderful numbers. Uh, those are all representative of a lot of the work that uh, Brown and Brown does work with me. Uh, they have actuaries on staff who make sure that the numbers that the carriers are giving us for renewals um, are actuarially sound. Um, they also help us with things like plan design. Um, funding, um, a lot of that behind the scenes work that, um, that they do for us. They also have um, dedicated folks to deal with compliance issues that, as you know, with um, employee benefits, there are a lot of uh, nuances, um, not just the Affordable Care Act right now that we're, we're still contending with, but also um, a lot of other uh, compliance items. On the property casualty side, um, they also act as our broker and our consultant. They do work, walk with us through um, more complicated claims issues, so that um, that represents our liability, our property, as well as our workers' comp uh, programs that we operate. So both programs are twofold, and when we did the RFP back in June, we submitted it as such, the um, request for proposal that we published did allow for us to review the respondents separately. So um, we could have had two different broker consultant groups. However, um, after review of the written proposals and interviews, we had a total of 10 respondents and uh, a team of folks who participated in the review and the interviews, we did determine that Brown and Brown was the strongest candidate for those services. So what we're asking is to uh, continue to use Brown and Brown with a new contract through 2024 for both, both arms of the services, uh, both broker and consultant for both benefits and the property casualty. Okay. Any questions? I have a few. Yeah, I'm ahead, sorry, just because I'm still the new guy. Um, Justine, the thing that jumped out at me was just the price tag on this. It seems, it, it, obviously, insurance for the county is very important, and it's worth tens of millions of dollars. Um, how did this, can you talk a little bit about how the process of choosing this group and, mm -hmm. and why you thought they were better and, and how their price compared to other folks? Okay. So the um, the price the price points were very they were very close. Um, it really came down to um, the services, the uh, the folks that they brought out for the interviews, not only um, and things like the, the types of services, um, they were also very comparable with all of the respondents that we looked at in our finalist review. Um, we had a team of, uh, of folks on the interview panel, not just from my department. Um, Colleen, the business services director was there as well as myself and then Lisa Trarnick um, was also there. Um, and so it wasn't just the folks who work with them, but we wanted to make sure that we did have representatives of other departments as well um, in what, there. What put these guys over the top? I'm sorry? What, what put these guys over the top? What, what uh, did they provide that other folks couldn't the, I, I would say it was the array of services as well as their, their expertise, their depth. Um, they have a very good and solid staff. It goes um, very deep as well. And um, so we have the folks who we deal with day to day, and then they also have 
uh, another bench to draw from. They have somebody on, on call for some of those detailed legal compliance questions. They have actuaries on staff. Um, they have a very good reputation with public entities in particular, which um, was something that is um, fairly unique, that when we were looking at folks who have experience with public entity, that definitely narrowed that field down. Um, and as well as the, the price was also very reasonable compared to the others. Okay, thank you. Questions? No. Good, All right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the contract for services with Brown and Brown Northwest in the amount of $703,694.10 to provide insurance broker and consulting services through December 31st, 2024. And I'll second it. Yeah, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. For this, this and everything else you do, Justine, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Happy New Year. Okay, next item is under District Attorney's Office. A couple people from the DA's office here with us this morning consider approval of a retroactive grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Justice Crime Victim and Survivor Services Division for funding for the Federal Victims of Crime Act and the State Criminal Fines Account in the amount of $1,354,816.26 through December 30th, 2021. Susanna. Good morning. Um, for the record, I'm Susanna Escobedo. I am the director of, the Marine, of our Victims Assistance Division um, uh, with the DA's office. And with me, I have Kathy Beach. She is our volunteer program coordinator, as well as our um, homicide response um, coordinator. And she is funded through this grant that we're going to be talking about today. So um, to give you guys a little bit of background uh, for, the, for your um, consideration as far as the grant. Um, as you mentioned, it is um, a federal and a state funded uh, grant. It's one of the grants that we have had for many, many years. It's one. It's the biggest grant that we have that funds um, our program. Um, we currently have um, six positions that are funded under the grant. We, uh, we got a new position under, um, we'll be bringing in a new position um, under this grant because there was additional money that was put into the pool. And so we have an additional advocate that's going to be starting with us pretty soon that actually um, just came through approval for the position. Um, we have a restitution um, advocate that works through the grant, uh, our volunteer coordinator, our juvenile program coordinator, um, the new position that I spoke about, and then we have two victim advocates, and one of who is bilingual. Um, and so when I was thinking about the numbers uh, to present to you guys as far as the victims that we serve, um, for this grant specifically, um, I think it's best if we talk about our program overall. Um, the last time I spoke with you guys, it was about our VOCA, our VOCA competitive grant. And so that one served specifically um, victims of um, property crime. Well, under this uh, grant, because we have our juvenile program coordinator who brings in all um, our volunteers um, that work with our program, um, I thought it was appropriate to talk about the, the program as a whole because our volunteers through Kathy, our volunteer program is one of the biggest programs um, in the state and without our volunteers, we couldn't do the, the work that we do. And so um, in the last year, we were able to serve over 8,500 victims. Wow. And a big part of that is done through our volunteers, which um, Kathy manages and recruits and does a great job of, of onboarding and bringing into the program with us. Um, our restitution clerk is part of a, a team that works with three other positions. Restitution, we talked a little bit about that last time, how important it is for, for our uh, clerks to be working on restitution and getting that as part of the, the process for, for victims and, and getting them hopefully financial compensation. Um, and then we have our juvenile program coordinator who is out at the juvenile department and she works very closely with the uh, juvenile department to ensure that victims of uh, juvenile offenses have, you know, somebody to go to court with them, to go over their rights with them, and so that's a really important part of our program, and that's also funded through the through this grant. Um, and we have our bilingual and our 
advocate positions who are going to court every day with victims and you know offering services, talking to victims about their rights, um, offering response at sexual assault calls, those type of things. Um, so pretty big grant and it funds most of the people that we have in our office. Um, it's a retroactive grant. Right now we're on a two-year cycle. Um, so it's a non-competitive grant, but every two years we do have to reapply for it and, um, and just you know, ensure that we get the funding and to continue offering the services that we offer through it. Questions for Susanna or Kathy? I have a question. Sure. Um, so it's amazing that you've been able to serve 8,500 victims. Yeah. Um, that's astonishing, especially for a staff of your size. Mm -hmm. I was talking to our uh, sheriff's department, and we have about 15,000 jail bookings a year. So... Um, 8,500 is about half of the people who are booked to jail. How does, how does, it, uh, how does the process work as far as assisting victims? Is, uh, do you have some victims who don't want any assistance? And uh, how, does, how does that outreach happen? So um, typically how we start with the case, I mean, cases come, come to us in many different ways. Um, but typically what we see is that we get, uh, one of the reports come in from the different law enforcement agencies, we, the reports come to us from the from our DAs, um, and then we start making contact with victims at that point um, about there is going to be an arraignment at three o'clock out at the jail because the defendant is in custody. Or we have um, a lot of cases that come in where we don't have somebody that's in custody, but we're making uh, contact to let them know, hey, there's a hearing coming up. These are what your rights are. Um, and the other part of your question was, uh, do sometimes victims not want services? And it does happen. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen where we, you know, when we're making contact with victims and they, they let us know that, you know, thank you, but I don't want any more information. You don't have to call. You don't have to go to court with us. What we find, though, is that um, oftentimes that is just in the moment because of their frustration with the system. Um, and then they, we always make sure that they know that you know, you get you can reach us anytime. Oftentimes, they're calling us back and saying, "Hey, this is what happened in court. Can you let me know what happened?" Um, or you know, sometimes they're just unhappy with the results of the system, and so we're uh, their sounding board for that, and that's okay. Um, but for the most part, when we're working with victims, it's from the start of the case to the end of the case, whether it's accompanying them or just giving victim notification um, by mail as well. Sometimes that's all they want. Um, and then we're also um, helping people that don't have criminal cases that come through through the process. And so anybody that is a victim of crime, even if they didn't report it, we're, we're assisting those people as well. Fabulous. Thank you. Sure. Uh, go ahead. Sir. Well, this isn't important to the substance, but I'm just curious. It says retroactive, and I wonder if there's an explanation for that. Something was there a reason why it is that way. It, some? Well, um, some of the grants that the Department of Justice um, they they manage they are competitive grants, and so those aren't guaranteed to be continued because this is a non-competitive one. It is, um, I guess it. Is it guaranteed that it wouldn't continue? It's, it's a pretty fair shot that as long as we do what we say we're going to do with the money and that we're managing it correctly and that there's still a community need, that we're going to continue to get it. So we don't have, it's not competitive. That's why it's retroactive, if that makes sense. Not quite, but. They have an explanation. Okay, I couldn't find it. Jane, you're on the yeah, micro microphone. It just says we met our deadline for the grant application process. The state was not able to submit this contract to us until this week. Oh, okay. But it would be something you look forward to, uh, whatever the period is, and, and we have to have. Yes, yes. Right. Thank you. A question, Kathy. How many uh, volunteers do you uh, coordinate in the department? Do you have any idea? Oh, yeah. Usually, at, at any given time, we have about 50 to 55 50. Um, active volunteers. 50. And they, they, we asked for a year commitment, typically we get much longer than that. So it's not as soon as a year is up, okay, I'm, you know, I'm done, I did my year. Um, people just stay, this kind of work is very important, it's very important to them, and, mm -hmm. and it's usually just their schedules that um, make it to where they can't volunteer anymore. But on, a, on any given time, it's about <coughs> 50 at a time. Can you, can you pick out a, a volunteer, um, a, a typical, maybe a, a scenario that a volunteer has done or goes through. I'm thinking of CASA and for mm -hmm. our youth, and mm -hmm. this is another extension mm -hmm. of 
that where some they, they're going through some extensive training, mm -hmm. I presume. So um, cost is very, very similar, but very different. So sure, they have a, sure. you know, just a very different role than we do, right. but the commitment and the training is very similar. So in order for anybody to volunteer with our program, they have to go through a minimum of 40 hours of training. And okay. that is to do be a sexual assault response advocate. Our court case advocates um, go through a minimum of 48 hours of training. And to be honest, they start with that 48 hours. There's two additional trainings after that that are, that are required if they want to do domestic violence cases or if they want to do children and juvenile. So that adds another 32 hours of training. Um, then we have computer training. By the time it's all done, they're, they're upwards of about 90 hours of training. So it's a huge commitment for okay. people in our community. And our, we have um, several interns, too, from all the different colleges. Um, but that's the kind of commitment that our, the people in this community make. It's, yeah. it's amazing every day. Great. That, that's why I wanted you to be on the record and talk about that because it's, uh, you know, every year we recognize volunteers and, and uh, the work that we do. Uh, we talked about 1,700 employees earlier today, but there's this very uh, expansive extension of <coughs> volunteers in all different places. And this is an example of a really important one. And then you interact, you're, you're interacting with organizations such as Center for Hope and Safety and um, um, Liberty, House. Liberty House. Yeah, I went to their, their uh, soiree uh, this year. Is that how you say it? Soiree. Soiree. Yeah, I went to their soiree this year and, you know, they raised money and the work that those types of organizations do and then the volunteers here too. So thank you so much for serving in that way. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that it's, it's unfortunate awesome that we have to have it, but, uh, and then you mentioned, uh, Commissioner 8500, some of those, and I'm thinking of those bookings, some of those are maybe not direct victims, right? right? You may right. have, uh, you know, we all know that selling drugs, there's some victims someplace in there, but that, that maybe it's a drug crime or something that there's not a direct victim that would be, um, and I'm sure the sheriff could name some others that. He's sitting mm -hmm. back there smiling at us. In fact, we just took a tour yesterday, and when you mentioned the hearings at 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. in the afternoon, we, we just took a tour of the jail yesterday and saw probably 25 yeah. people lined up for those. For the arraignments, yeah. For, for their what? For the arraignments. For the arraignments, yeah, yeah not hearings, yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, I imagine the sheriff sitting back there like, you guys ask me questions all the time. I'm off duty right now. Yeah, <laughs> off duty. And, you shouldn't have and, came. And, and like us, we're never off oh, duty. So yeah, exactly. Great. Well, uh, I guess we'll take a motion to uh, approve the retroactive grant. Chair Cameron, I make a motion a little bit longer than normal that we do approve the grant agreement with Oregon Department of Justice, Crime Victim and Survivor Services Division for funding of, for Federal Victims of Crime Act and the State Criminal Fines account in the amount of $1,354,816.26 through September 30th, 2021. And I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you for your service. Thank Both you and Happy New much. Year. Great. All right, next item is Public Works. Consider approval of a public improvement agreement with Emory & Sons Construction Group, LLC, in the amount of $436,752.50 for the construction of sidewalks and American with Disabilities ADA ramps at various locations and replace the pedestrian push buttons at one intersection in Marion County. Hey, Lonnie. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Happy New Year to all of you. I yeah. hope you had good Christmases with your family. Um, thanks for having us today for the record. Lonnie Radke, County Engineer, Engineering Division of the Public Works Department. And I'm Shane Otteson, Jr. I'm a Project Engineer with Marion County. Hey, Shane. And it's exciting to think that we're your last action at the last board session of the decade. So yay, let's hope Isn't this is a positive cool? one, huh? <laughs> Shouldn't you wait till you're done? I know. <laughs> I'm hopeful. Yeah, maybe, I'm always maybe, hopeful. Maybe we want to have a little debate. <laughs> Suddenly, That's how we want to end the decade. You know, Sam, He's feeling it. <laughs> after I broke my foot, I'm very sympathetic to these. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah, you've had some, yeah. some real life experience, yes. So today we're asking for an approval on a public improvement 
um, agreement uh, with Emory and Sons. We're going to go through a presentation, um, but it's for various sidewalk improvements and, and ADA facility improvements within the right of way within the city of Salem and the city of, of Donald. So I'm going to turn it over to Shane because he is our project engineer managing this project. All right. So um, the, the sidewalk project covers three different areas, um, two of them which are in Salem, um, and one of them is on the intersection of 45th Avenue and Silverton Road. Um, this will actually cover the south side project, and the other one is on Hayesville Drive, and you may uh, be asking the question that we have other projects, um, specifically 45th Avenue, um, um, that goes north of this, and why wasn't this part of that project? And that's because the grant application only covered the north half of the intersection. Um, and the county had, had, has long wanted to replace the sidewalk on the south side, um, kind of going further to the west than what the grant application was for. Um, there's a lot of driveway drops there that go up and down, and there's, really, there's no driveways there. So it's kind of a, um, a hazard. Well, it's not a hazard, but it's just difficult for the pedestrians. Mm -hmm. Um, so this will improve those sections. And it'll also put new pedestrian push buttons that meet the ADA standards. Um, it'll set up the intersection so once the 45th, the north side, the 45th Avenue project is complete, the whole intersection will be ADA compliant. And then on Hayesville Drive, this is another area where um, um, there is sidewalk currently on the south side in this area, except for this one property. And I think it's because they were uh, one of the original homes of the area when before it was subdivided and so when everything was subdivided they weren't required to put in sidewalks in their section and so this will fill in the that small section of sidewalk and will give a continuous pedestrian path at least for that area and then the <clears throat> third area will be in the city of Donald and this will be for the entire Main Street corridor there in Donald um, it starts from Butteville Road and goes all the way to wow. approximately the railroad tracks there, um, just east of William Street. Um, and th this will replace 28 ADA ramps um, and replace uh, large sections wow. of the sidewalk as well. There's um, the sidewalk there in many places are in very bad re um, conditions and they need replacing. And so we were able to help out Donald by um, providing the engineering services and um, the contract administration portion of the project and then Donald um, will pay for the construction portion of um, this new sidewalk and ramps. And they also received a $50,000 grant from ODOT for a small city allotment grant um, that will help um, fund some of the, some of the ramps. Um, it's a Is really it good up? thing to help out Donald and, and get them new sidewalks and ramps and, and, and we're, so, we're, oh, go ahead. So, just a question. So, Main Street is the street that runs the Donald Cafe. Is that where, yeah. where the Donald Cafe is? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, when I go there to have breakfast, I can not trip anymore. Yeah, huh? yeah. exactly. <laughs> right. Good place to have breakfast, by yeah, the way. Yes. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> and we're also, we will be coming through to resurface Main, mm -hmm. Main Street here in the next couple of years. So, it's important to get the ramps done before that. because Is, is that our street? Jurisdiction Main yeah. Street is. I know Butteville is, but yep. even Main Street is. Huh? Yeah, Main okay. Street is as well. Yep, and we had to replace or the ADA ramps have to be replaced before we could go through and resurface. So it's kind of a win-win for both of us. Mm -hmm. We're, we'll be able to go in and, and upgrade our road by resurfacing it, and then they also get new ADA ramps. Mm -hmm. And just uh, giving you a little teaser, next decade we'll be talking more about the ADA transition plan and you'll, you'll be hearing a lot more about this because obviously the ADA compliance is becoming more and more important and we're working toward that. Before yep. they leave Don, this one really pleases me, you know. Um, these are the type of things we can do to really help small communities mm -hmm. and what the growth they're gonna have and the approved mm -hmm. subdivision and things, I don't know percentage-wise, but I bet you it's probably about the highest increase that, that'll be seen in our cities, yeah. percentage-wise. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're getting ready for that growth, and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm happy we could help. Yeah, you know, it, we, it just, we can talk, <clears throat> but, I mean, that's a great point, that the percentage of their growth, based on that urban growth uh, boundary expansion that they just uh, got last year, wasn't it? I think mm -hmm. we've proved that. And then you think of Woodburn, you know, all these places, Woodburn, Sublimity, I mean, the growth that they're 
Well, it, that in growth in sublimi is internal, but right. Woodburn and, and Donald both have some enlargements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just some of our <clears throat> cities that are really growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Staten, mm -hmm. Woodburn. Mm -hmm. It's great to see us partnering with yeah. the cities. Mm -hmm. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. Really hoping, that, that's something we talk about a lot, we're really hoping to strengthen those relationships because we can, so many win-win, you know, yeah. situations that yeah, we can, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to hand Donald a check for $15,000 for economic development, too, right? That's another subject. Okay. <laughs> Just because I'm thinking of it, I was in St. Paul this last week duck hunting, actually, but I stopped at the bank and I got, to, you know, standing right at that intersection with the changes there and it and the it speed <coughs> limit changed. So we've been doing a lot of things and I, you, I should say you have, yeah, but it's good. It's mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. All right. So these are a few pictures of kind of the existing conditions out there. Um, the one on the left, the Hayesville Drive, you can see that that's a small section of sidewalk that ha hadn't been there. Um, so people had been, you can kind of see the path, had been walking on the, on the grassway. Um, and then the, the one up on the upper right corner is uh, the south side of the Silverton Road and 45th Avenue. And then you can see a couple pictures from the city of Donald um, in the bottom right corner wow. there. Um, you can see that sidewalks are missing um, and they're in poor conditions and also the ADA ramps are non-compliant. Can I interrupt again? Yes, yes. sir. Absolutely. Just kind of so you know, I have a, a friendship with uh, Bill Puller. I've heard it said Paler with the Statesman. And he uh, intimated to me that this project we're doing on Hay Hayesville Road is generating more comments and happy comments than anything they've ever seen before at the Statesman. I don't know why, I just, but I felt like yeah. I think people know when, it's, when you're making it better for them and, and they're pleased. And, that's all we're trying to do here. So um, I'm ha I hope that's true, and I hope they'll continue to be happy as we move on with that project. I've been at a couple of, I, I was at a neighborhood meeting, the, the Jan Ray um, neighborhood meeting a couple of months ago, and I was surprised at the positive response that we were getting at Public Works um, for the projects that we're working on that will be coming, but also for the street lighting. I don't know if you're... Yes, yeah, so yeah. we're aware. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, Brian, actually, he presented at the last... And, and th I was really, really pleased with all the positive um, feedback we were getting. So that's... I got one more comment that isn't so good. We've also done some nice developments in areas of the county where we really upgraded uh, roadways and get nothing but criticism because how come it couldn't be better? So you mm -hmm. can't win them all, I yeah. guess. But we'll Are you try. referring to a no winter creek? No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I knew you had to get that in today. <laughs> yeah. All right. So with um, with this project, we'll be updating um, the sidewalks, making sure that all the ADA ramps are compliant. Um, We'll also be filling in those missing sections of sidewalk, as I mentioned, and then we'll be installing the new pedestrian push buttons on the south side of the Silverton Road and 45th Avenue intersection. Um, so our low bidder was Emory & Sons Construction Group with a bid of $436,752.50. Um, and as I had mentioned, that the city of Donald will pay for their portion of the work that isn't in the roadway surface. That's our jurisdiction so we're paying for that portion but they're paying for all the other work um, there and it's up to two hundred ten thousand um, dollars and we had seven res seven responsive bidders so we had actually a really good turnout for the bid um, and they range from four hundred thirty six thousand to I think it was around six hundred thirty thousand so um, there was a little bit of a range there but Emory and some sons was the low bidder and we um, hope to start um, January of 2020 so soon and um, the work would be completed by June 30th of 2020, so a fairly short window, but um, it'll be good. So is this $210 that Donald will pay up to, is that included in the 436, or is that in addition to the no, 436? That, you would subtract the, the 210000 from the $436,000. Okay. And, and where is our portion of the money coming from? Um, we have an annual sidewalk um, fund okay. that, we, that we use. And, I, and that's it for the presentation. If you guys have any questions, good. yeah. Anything good? I feel like we got them all done during the presentation. All right. 
Go right ahead and make a motion. And Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the public improvement agreement with Emory & Sons Construction Group, LLC, in the amount of $436,752.50 for the construction of sidewalks and American with Disabilities Act ramps at various locations and replace the pedestrian push buttons at one intersection in Marion County. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's the last one of the year. Hooray. Maybe I'll say no. <laughs> oh. No. It passed anyway. And I know. It'd just be kind of fun. <laughs> the people would say, what was that no vote? <laughs> just, like, just doesn't care about no I will, vote. Uh, <laughs> the chair says aye. <laughs> all right. With that, we have uh, completed our action for the day, our general business for Thank the you. day. Thank you for all the work that you're doing and the great things that are happening at Public Works these days. It's always fun to see the um, above and beyond reports, too, that the positive feedback that we, we get. Because we get, we get enough of the, we just paved a really nice road. How much was Winter Creek? How much did we spend on that? How many Money, millions? I got 1.4. It was, it was a millions of dollars, and then people, we, we didn't do it good enough. But... We hear about that, but thank I have, you. I have to say, we have an incredible team, and I'm really, really proud to be yeah. part of it. So, yeah, thank you. And an attitude reflects leadership. Yeah. You guys are cooking right now. Yeah, keep it up. Go get them. I got one more thing to have for a long. By the way, I, I have to give credit to that to remember the Titans. <laughs> I want to tell a little story real quick before Lonnie leaves. You can, you don't have to sit there and take okay. it, but. Uh, <laughs> Very helpful to me. I had an opportunity to, to uh, testify before AMWAC. Happened to be on the on the Aurora, the Donald interchange that we care about so much. And uh, Lonnie was actually in Eugene, where I thought we were going to meet, but I had left. But they got the documents and the ideas needed, and the presentation went real well. So well, in fact, I predict that we we may see some additional movement on the Donald uh, interchange. So thank you. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, again, team effort. We had we had a few people help and get all that together for you. So really, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. One of the things that I just so appreciate about uh, the folks over at Public Works is that it just seems like they uh, have this attitude of how do we get to yes, which so often we hear uh, complaints at other agencies about, oh, this agency is always, it's always a no. It's always another reason why they can't do something. And um, I just feel like you guys are just such good problem solvers where if you guys say we can't do it, I know that you've looked at like <laughs> 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 different options of how you can do it. Um, and I just really appreciate that attitude of, is there any way we can make this work for the people of Marion County? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Brian Nicholas, I can't say enough great things. I've only been here now for five months and and he is such a big part of that philosophy and, and that moving in, you know moving in that direction and I'm sure that you're you're all aware that we're working on our, our workplace culture mm -hmm. and making some huge improvements and that is such a big part of it. Um, sometimes you know we unfortunately do have to say no but hoping that we're communicating everything leading up to it and and a lot of times a no can actually lead to well maybe you just need to talk to to this other agency or we need to find some other solutions and so instead of it just being a no endpoint like there's just nothing beyond here we're really always trying to find more I, beyond that i i just i love what you just said because i i think of and again i'm gonna go back to the restaurant business and somebody would walk in you know we have operated these little cafes and somebody would walk in you know not that they ever said but can you get me lobster mm -hmm. and instead of saying no I'd say sure I can get it it'll take me probably three or four hours and it'll cost you $150 <laughs> do you still want it right and I think when can you, you still do that uh, you want lobster Kinda. well I can get it for you this is what it's going to cost you mm -hmm. but instead of saying no giving a solution to mm -hmm. it and then letting the customer say no or the, the, the client say no. And I think what you just said, it's like even to the fo the point where, uh, well, we we are unable to do it that way, but if if you want some help changing the law so we can we can actually get it done, then here's the solution yes. to changing the law. I mean, mm -hmm. it's 
it's really in, until somebody says, well, you know, maybe I don't want to go through all that effort. Right. But um, it's sometimes it's our hands are tied uh, to do it. But I, no I, I agree with what you're saying. There's a cultural shift change that mm -hmm. um, is really making a difference mm -hmm. to. In, and, and it's it's something, and again, I, I don't want to take your time here, but I, I even can reflect on an experience yesterday with a very minor timekeeping issue, and I talked to the timekeeper, and not only did she take responsibility partially for what was hers, she also immediately was trying to help me find a solution. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to Brian about it, and it was the same attitude, and, and that's not what you find everywhere. Sometimes people just, well, that's just the way it is, mm -hmm. and I don't feel like that. Mm -hmm. it, it's People are, are looking out for each other and, and trying to find solutions. So And it has an impact outside of your department, frankly. I mean, even us, we can sort of feel the energy that you guys bring to your job. You that's know, when, when you have awesome. a team that's just cruising, everybody's a whoa. We should be more like that. We should try. We should be more open. We should try this. You know, it's sort of uh, you, you build everybody else up. So. Well, and it is such a team effort, and it just it feels that it. I mean, it feels that good. It, it's it's pretty fun time to be at Public Works. So. Well, thank anyway. you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Happy New Year. Wow. And I think she actually mentioned the next decade in her presentation. That's a long ways away. A decade. That's ten years. Uh, where was I yesterday? Someplace, um, and we were talking about. <clears throat> was it with you? I don't remember. Somewhere we were talking. Oh yeah, it was you. It was Y two K. Oh. And we were we were talking about Y two K, and I and I remember, I shared the story of having a party at my house, and at midnight everybody was counting down, and I shut off the breaker, and everybody went whoa, and then somebody looked out an acre and a half away and said, "There's lights Wait on over a there." Second. Yeah, right. You, you, <laughs> <laughs> Something was going on. I remember David Withnell came in and came down in the garage and said, turn the lights back. <laughs> um, but that just seemed like yesterday. It's and 20 it's years. 20 years. It's two decades since Y2K and how. Uh, and then I was reflecting on, um, I don't remember switching decades from the 50s to the 60s because I was just a young guy. You may remember. Um, Wait, we had that age discrimination thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but I do remember going from the 60s to the 70s and what a big deal that was to me as a young man at that time, a, a teenager or whatever I was, and, and how big of a deal it was to go from one decade to another. And now it's just like they're just decades are like years. They're just like popping. Why no. do you look at me? Yes, I've been through it all. I know. It's what, true. What did you admit it's, you didn't even know today? One of the most... What, Johnny what Carson. I've never seen that. Johnny I've Carson. I've never seen Johnny Carson. Oh, yeah, because I was going to... What was it? I was going to do the... Yeah. The, yeah. Au contraire, the prediction. bicycle breath. Predictions. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Bicycle? If, if, it, if it makes you feel better, once I had kids, I started seeing the years clip by pretty fast. My oldest daughter is almost seven, and I, it, I was like, I just got married yesterday. That's not, that's not a thing. So, kind of for the record, too, I want to thank you, Commissioner Cameron, Kevin, if I may, for the year you spent as our chair. Just for people's information, we, we rotate every year, usually in an order, sometimes not. Uh, but, but it's a job to represent the board, to look through material that comes through first, to chair the meetings. I think you did an excellent job. Not perfect, but excellent. <laughs> And, I, and I, I really appreciate your efforts, and it was a good year. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to always try to reach perfection, right? I never will. No. I know, especially when it's your standard. I yeah. want to echo that. Yeah. Because it's work. Yeah. You, know, you have to yeah. do extra work, and so thank you for, for doing that this year. Well, um, and as our engineer just said, it's a team effort because uh, Brenda down there, uh, makes this thing look like it's seamless every week and staff gets together and does all this planning and organizes and look when when I got here what six years ago we were we were stumbling through big notebooks still I mean look where, we're, where now we get computers that we can see everything on and uh, um, it's been a fun year and it's it's we haven't I'm just trying to think not enough controversy did, I was just gonna say did we do the solar in my <laughs> was, did we do this, did we do the far, farm solar this year was I chair no it was last year 
Janet didn't was hear chair. much of it this year. Still working uh, on policies. Okay, and then when did we do? When did we shut down the? The that was last year too. The um, we didn't shut down. We the the one we did this year was um, the bed and breakfast. No, was, wasn't that this year? That was last year. Too. Was that with that, Janet too? Yes, she was. So see, so Janet left, and it's just gotten happened. easy. The controversy left with her. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Do you think she attracted Commissioner her? Carlson, if you if you're watching, we she we probably miss is. You. That's an issue. <laughs> we miss you, and uh, I know you know it's interesting. T speaking of people um, watching, uh, there's a gentleman. I went to Trexler Farm Saturday night. I have season tickets for their concert series that um, KYKN. Is it KYKN up there? And that that. Um, Ken, uh, no, no, that's not K, but anyway. K, K, Y, K, C, K, Y, K, C. Ken is the, the yeah, Cartwright. Cartwright that runs it. Anyways, he does these concerts as fundraisers for it. And there was a gentleman on the break came up to me and he said, uh, introduced himself. And uh, his name's Charles McAllister. And uh, he says that he watches us every week. Oh, dear. And so, Charles, if you're out there, we wanted to say hi and Happy New Year to you. Um, and I said, you're, you're probably one of the two or three people that watch us. Right? <laughs> my kids do, apparently. Do they? Yeah, they'll say, I liked your tie. I'm not kidding you. Speaking yeah, of which. Yeah, I know. I brought that up on purpose. Speaking, Christmas gifts. Speaking mm -hmm. of which, um, when I was in Europe, I had this, like, vision of how life could be so, in sublimity. Mm. And... Mm. And, and what, was, what was the vision? I, I don't live in sublimity, but I I love the town. I love going through there and going to the wooden nickel or, you know, getting gas at the corner. And then you know, the other guy has a pizza little place over there. And, uh, yeah, yeah, really yeah. good pizza. Good pizza. Uh, cinnamon rolls, let's talk serious. Cinnamon and the, rolls. And the breadsticks. Um, Slam. And then we go to Staten, and I thought, well, Staten's just across the highway. And if there's ever a traffic jam between those two cities that you guys could both use a tie that would help you um, feel really good about riding a bicycle hmm. between Staten and Sublimity. Because there's a bike path, I think, on that road that has well, been... Are you trying to just, what, crack me in the throat or something? Like, <laughs> no, I just... Let me tell you about that. So I got, I got us all and I to show our, uh, yeah, to show our nice. um, you know, we, we want to have all forms of transportation and we're doing our best. And not only that, but we're even, I mean, you even got the colors, right? You got the blue in the middle and the two reds. I mean, it's, it's very balanced here. Yeah, you really sorted this out. See, I got to get, Chair. I'm going to tell you something about that particular. Because, Funny you would bring I'm, that up. I don't uh, know hey, if there's a background. You know, there's a reason I have the blue tie, because I'm more, uh, like, liberal than you two guys, right? Is that right? I think so. That's why they gave me the blue one. Jeez. <laughs> I want to tell you now. About oh, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> here it comes. That was when I first became sensitized to the waste of bicycle paths. Now, there's a place for them, but that one. It was an additional $300,000, delayed the project, and I'm telling you, after 20 years, I've not seen a bike on it yet. I'm not kidding you. Between Sublimity and Staten? <laughs> Absolutely. So, so what's that about? So it's, it's really a good sport of you to wear a bicycle tie when you feel that I way. like bikes. I like it for kids and recreation, getting to school. I'm all for it. But to build, I, I, I'm not here to make a big rant on it. No, no, I just... I just uh, I think we, we, um, yeah, we. Well, let's talk about it just before I leave it. This that lane Hayes, right that there, Hayes, that Church Hayes. Street, High Street. How long has that been? Six, seven years? And I've been, I'm, I tell this story, but it's still true. I'm, I'm up to about seeing 10 bikes on it. And I don't stare at it or anything, but I can see it from my office window. I come in from work. I've seen about 10. Two of those were on the sidewalk, but I count them because I think their efforts were good. So now, what does that cost? Well, there's a new law. Thousands of cars that would have used it every day. We can't get out of our building at the rush hours until try to squeeze in little bits. So what did that prove? So I actually, Commissioner, I, I agree with you on this. I was, oh, I was just I was just in Portland. But, I mean, I think I think bike paths have their place. But I was just in Portland, and um, I was on a road that that my parents have lived on for a long time, and they eliminated a lane to put in a bike path. And it really made the road worse. So, well, so before it was so. just sort of yeah, theoretical, right, but yeah. but I actually I actually drove on it, and it made the traffic worse. I didn't see any bikes. It screwed up. The, I thought it was dangerous because it kind of pushed sure. this island into the path of flow of traffic. And it was one of these things where 
I, I was driving down the street, the street and I was like, oh, this, this seems to almost be purely ideological because it doesn't, they didn't actually improve anybody's life. Yeah. Why don't they build it where there's a demand for it? That maybe I'll be fine. That isn't wasted. That I'm kind of sorry I got these ties yeah. for us. I'm going to say one other like, thing before you let, get me off. There's two state laws that I just detest. One is, do you know, and then we had a person come. I didn't understand it at the time. That you have to allow a, ro a room for a bike to fall over sideways and not hit your vehicle. Oh, Are no, I was, I was there when we passed that so law. In that, oh. <laughs> I was in the legislature. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I did because I remember I remember right after the law passed and you know I lived out South Liberty Road about 20 minutes into town and I remember after we passed that law I was trying to get into town on Liberty Road and there was two uh, bicyclists on Liberty Road out in the country in the middle of the road and I remember uh, coming home that night and uh, speaking about that particular law and saying now how was I supposed to past these guys and leave enough room that if they fell over um, I would be fur enough out and they were in the middle of the road and I, I mean I just I went well come on out of respect would you please pull over so I can pass you and leave enough well, room yes, but I know too. I was there I, I remember this person came and showed one of our gravel trucks too close to the bicycle lane and the bike is right on the left side I mean come on have a clue but that, in other so, words, if you hit a bicycle, you're, you're guilty. Then that's mm -hmm. how it is. And you see that important all the time. Now today, we start with this new rolling stop thing. Come on, how can that be good? Get out of my way. That's all I'm going to tell you. I just think, it, I think it's, it's, a, it's, not, a, it's no, not a good thing for our community. Some of this stuff just doesn't make sense or not, right? It and doesn't I, make I think dedicated bike lanes make Too sense. aggressive driving bikes. I think bikes. dedicated bike lanes are great. I don't think dedicated bike lanes are great if you're eliminating Flow of traffic in order to, makes to do dangerous. that. It makes That's it more dangerous. dangerous. It makes it worse. Let's right? get on to happier things. Yeah. So, you, you brought this up with these so, ties. I might have to give it back. Because I think you. before one of my, um, I didn't make a resolution, but one of my thoughts in the next decade, which is like starting tomorrow, I'm going to make an effort. To, to what? Do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from Detroit? What kind of an effort are we I, talking I'm about? I'm not going to write it from Detroit, but I may, you know, I, what I love about working here in, in downtown is I really enjoy putting on my, you know, in the, in the wintertime, putting on my long wool coat, taking an umbrella and walking everywhere to whether it's a convention like center or whatever. Too. I yeah. love the exercise that I get from doing that and the healthy lifestyle of being able to walk. And... You, you know as well as I do, if you get in the car down below and you try to go find a place over at the convention center on some of those deals, That's true. You, you're, you're spending more time trying and energy driving place. around trying to figure out a parking place and you could have walked it by then. Yeah, about the third and, time I go around, I get a good one, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't know where, but uh, I want to I wanna, uh, Let's talk do that about for what, my what health. What are we going to accomplish my this next year? Give me something to look forward to. What do you, what do you got in your mind? You're going to solve homelessness, I know. Well, we're going to plan a going away sure, party for you. progress. I think we, yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, you got to have a banner year. Away, uh, he's planning an away, going away party for you. Yeah, it's donuts and Yeah, you can take a lot of planning. Pizza. Tiger tails. Donuts and pizza, right? But if you want to change your mind and stay, I won't knock it. No, I think you <laughs> pretty well sabotage that. <laughs> so uh, we got a lot of work ahead of us, um, if you want to be serious for I a do. moment. Um, you know me. I'm always serious. You know, this, this solid waste oh. issue uh, is um, really important. And, and, you know, I know people put their trash cans out and put their recycle out, and hopefully they're getting better at what they're supposed to put in there and not. And, and I think uh, one of the things that we need to work on is communication with our um, environmental services and the money they're spending on advertising because a, a lot of it's focused on recycle. I see it like I saw an ad, I think I was at the movie theater yeah. or something, and I saw, and it's about recycling. No, we need to focus on the, the other two R's. You know, we need to focus on the reduction and reusing because, you know, when that lady who was uh, very um, passionate about uh, zero waste, I mean, you're not going to get to zero waste, but you can reduce uh, what you're, what you're using. Um, I even uh, stopped at Roth's in Staten yesterday and I remembered to grab my bag out of my car. 
Now, I forgot to put it back in this morning, so if I had to stop at the grocery store. But it's habits, right? It's changing uh, some of the things. Um, the I last just think all the trips I may make out to my car, one arm load of cans and cereal boxes, and then come back and get another one. Well, and, and It'll um, be great. I've been with... I've, Nonsense. I've been, I've been <clears> in <throat> situations where I was with somebody, and, and they said, she said, just, just roll the golf... Uh, or the, 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 uh, grocery cart out to the car and unload it in the car we didn't need you know into a box or whatever so there's ways you can you can think you're about so that. much more reasonable than I am I'm I am impressed right now but I, I think you know we do have a story to tell on our solid waste system and also on our public safety system as well I mean I think um, people outside of Marion County don't really understand the difference like you know, you know I remember we were, we were in a one of these meetings and Commissioner Montana, you were like, this is the best solid waste system in the state. And, you know, you're kind of, um, but people don't necessarily know that. They just sort of think it's all the same. You know, they don't know how um, we have this incredible recycling program. And then uh, the garbage that we dispose of in the incinerator actually generates electricity after we've pulled out all the different things that we can out of that process and even metal out of the and we're edge. very unique in that regard you know yeah. and so i think one of the things that i that i think we need to really do a better job of and I, and i think i think people in marion county understand is getting getting that story out beyond the the borders of marion county so that so that people just don't assume that oh garbage is garbage like no we we do a much better job than other people do and and i want to say the similar thing about our public safety system and and our sheriff's department and we're not just the same as every other sheriff's department you know and and i think uh, that's something that that we can really you know i'm going to go back to it just for a second because i've actually <laughs> i've driven down from sublimity thinking and thinking out loud i'm sorry i talk to myself now you know mm -hmm. uh how i would make presentations to the legislature on, on just how our our system is superior and needs to continue and and so I'm just bringing it up now. I think we really have to have a legislative effort, whether we do it this year in a short session or one final uh, mm -hmm. in the following year. But something that really, by the time we're done, legislators should want to have those facilities in, in their, their own district, districts, mm -hmm. yeah. not try to uh, scrap ours in favor mm -hmm. of long transportation and, and land disposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, and I'm making some notes here because I, I just put 2030 down. What's 2030 look like? What's 10 years from now look like? What are some of the things that, and I, and I, I wrote down cars. If we really want cars, and, and the batteries are getting much better. I think I've, what I heard was Ford's coming out with a, a Ford 150 pickup truck, electric. And a Mustang, I saw it. And a Mustang, right? And you now have uh, Teslas that'll go 300 miles on a charge on a battery. I mean, that's doable, right? Um, so, but if we're gonna if we're gonna switch from carbon based to electricity, we need the electricity. So taking our solid waste and turning it into electricity to charge the car that you're driving down, driving around makes sense, right? And you can you you can measure everything that's coming out of that system. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas you're spreading it on the ground, and you know this, you you can't measure it all, although they say they can. NASA just measured it in California, and you can look at those at landfills. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. landfills are one of the biggest, biggest Emitters of, of, of greenhouse, greenhouse gas. gas. I hate to knock landfills to try to build right. our system up because it is the method that 99% of the rest of the country has to use. But um, there has to be some allowance for the reality of, of the uh, emissions generated from landfills, both methane and CO2 when you compare with what we do, and they don't do that. They don't look at both sides of the equation to say, is this really so horrible or so good? I also, I, I think, you know, the generational equity piece is really important for me. You know, I, I remember even with the PERS thing, we talk a lot about PERS, and I think one of the things that I don't, uh, I don't think it's fair to blame public employees for PERS, you know, I, I or, or the burden that counties like us or cities have. It's, you know, it's people have worked oftentimes their whole lives, um, and, and it was the politicians and legislature 30 or 40 years ago that, that made some of the goofy decisions they made. But I do think that, like in the PERS situation, it's not necessarily fair for just one generation to have to bear the brunt of, you know, the cost of public employees over 50 years. In the same way with, with garbage, I don't think it makes sense for us to put all this garbage into the ground, 
with the knowledge that another generation is going to have to clean it up, right? It doesn't yeah. make any sense to, it, it so, you know, we'll have multiple right. generations creating all this garbage, but one generation eventually is going to have to deal with the mess. I don't think that's really fair, you know? Right. Look at the messes we're cleaning up from previous, uh, you know, like hot service spots. stations, for right. example. Hot spots that, 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 that weren't done right, yeah. Right. Oh. Woodburn, when they built the, their second street, you know, they found, I'm making this up a little bit, but, but about 20 different fuel tanks they didn't even know existed right. that added to the cost and stuff. But in the day, that's, uh, they were like uh, for fuel oil or heating oil, I should say. Um, but a big burden yeah. for somebody else to clean up. Yeah, that's not fair. I'll quit leaving so, a mess just for you. <laughs> so, I'm so, trying. Ten, so, so 10 years from now, I mean, you want to know what's going to happen in 2020. I don't, I mean, we got work Well, to you do, started but. to say something we should finish. If you're saying there will be a shift for a, a continued reliance on automobiles, ought not we have another bridge or some right. better transportation or, or, uh, here or, in this or area? Or even, even bicycles, and you know, the, there's, there's bicycles now that are electric powered, right? They're uh, aid assisted bicycles. Uh, that what do they run on? Electricity. I mean, if you want, you got to have electricity if we're going to make the shift. There was a special that troubled me that we haven't talked about, but it showed about the the uh, shortage of electricity the Northwest will have as we take out uh, coal and mm. and even some natural gas plants around. The one number that they shot for uh, ninety five percent reliability. In other words, five percent of the time you'd have a risk of brownouts. Well, under the new scenario, as they take these out, it goes up to 26%, I saw, and even worse. Yikes. So we're going to head for real disaster. Look at California. How would you like it if you got your restaurant that you suddenly can't use or your grocery store with everything melting? Or your electric car. Or, or your house here in Oregon that uh, you can't yeah, You've got to have reliability. Uh, and they're just ignoring that in favor of the environment. Well, the bottom line first ought to be reliability. Yeah. Well, and I think it, it also goes to just how much we take for granted these systems. I had experience two or three years ago where um, uh, a guy from Tanzania came over here and we were having dinner with him. And he didn't want to, the only things he, he I remember asking him, what did, what did you think about Oregon, what do you think? And he said, I want to know, how do you get clean water to every house? No. And how do you make it so the electricity doesn't tur ever turn off? Those were the things he wanted to know, and, I, and it kind of struck me that, oh, that was, that was decades of hard work from people figuring out how to do that, because where he comes from, they can't figure out how to do it. They can't figure out how to get clean water, and they can't figure out how to get reliable electricity everywhere, and part of the problem is the corruption, right? He said, you know, one of the issues they deal with is getting people to, to work, because so many people will say, hey, I'll hire you to do this, and they just won't pay you after you do the work. Yeah. And so if you have this sort of corrupt system or the government will take the money and you know, people in the government will take it personally instead of actually using it to build the infrastructure, um, I think we just sort of take for granted these things. Like when we put our garbage out, it gets picked up, it gets disposed of, it's not left in our streets. When we flush the toilet, the waste goes away. You know, not everyone in the world can yeah. they just take that for granted. You know, And so I do think... When it comes to you know improving our system, we want to make sure that we don't break what people spent their lives putting together for us, so that we can take it for granted. Jane, any predictions? Next year, next decade. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I love a sales limitation department that says it's going to be a good year. <laughs> That's very unfair. I, no, I, no, no, no. That's, that's not a sales unfair. No, this, you know what you're, <laughs> lots of lawsuits. I think, I think uh, Jay, our legal department is, is fabulous. Jokes I was, it was, it was, it was, yeah, that's a, that's not, I don't say that about Jane's department. I, that was years ago in, in another business that I was in. I relabeled the legal department, the sales limitation department. But always, Jane is one of those departments, like you said earlier, our public works. How do we get true. to yes? Jane, thank you for your leadership. No predictions? It's going to be a good, good year. Let's pick on Jan Fritz a little yeah. bit. Just so people know, that carries the entire weight of, on her shoulders of the county. That's right, with a smile, 24 too. hours a day, seven days a Look week. And always happy. Try to even keep yeah. us in line. It's a, it's a <laughs> big <laughs> job. <laughs> Jan, yes. predictions. No oh, good. Microphone. Yeah. Oh. HR department works wonderfully. 
That's a good one. Yes, we have a new HR department. We have a workforce that's engaged and empowered and willing to do what you saw from public works. We all get the spirit. We all engage in um, how we serve the public. I think that really will be something that will have Marion County shine above all others. One of the predictions I'll make is 10 years from now, I don't know what our ratio is of employees per citizens, but I know that that ratio will be even smaller or larger, more, more citizens per employee because of the investments we're making in technology. Uh, and uh, Sheriff Cast is here, maybe we'll call on him for some predictions, but you think of, of having to do more with the same staff, mm -hmm. um, that that's something that we will. Uh, we've looked at our forecast for five years. You know, five years down the road, and where we're at, we can't add FTEs and uh, be sustainable. So, that's definitely something. Our productivity will go up because of technology and finding new ways to do what we already do. <clears throat> and we could talk about some of those things we're already doing in our pub public safety system and our public works department and. Um, so that'll be something that we'll see. Since I won't be dealing with it directly, so in 10 years, do we have enlarged jail? I think so. I think, I, I think that'll probably happen. I mean, it, it, if nothing else, I think we've all said we need to figure out a way to staff GPOD, and so we just have to, that'll at least add 100 beds to the jail. Uh, more than we have now. So I think that that'll happen within 10 years. Beyond I'm going to interrupt knows? myself here and say I hope so. And I'm going to yeah. give you my own little lesson from my first year here. After a survey of different communities and the conclusions were, I'll just sum it up real quick. People want good roads and public safety. And you give them that and they're happy. And that's our job. And I think that demands, in my mind, more jail space. Uh, I agree with that. And I, and I think, not that we have a big impact on it, but education. If we had good accountability <coughs> education, my daughter teaches second grade, and, and uh, she's got a cast on, by the way, so she can't go back. Because, I mean, she, she had a second grader. I'm not going to say it on the record, but you can imagine what this, this sec, second grader told her to go off, mm. right? And... And we saw, um, I saw some video, it was from one of the TV stations about these teachers and what was happening in the classrooms, the, the lack of discipline in the classrooms. And so we're investing, you know, we can invest money, but how do you, how do you change an education system where there's no discipline? If you or I would have done that, what would have happened to us, right? Uh, I have to. <laughs> so, no, I don't have to so, confess So I think public problems. safety, yeah, pu they want roads and public safety, but but I, the, 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 I don't know how you get there with the, the breakdown of the family or whatever it is, but uh, some of the people we saw in, in Joe's um, facility yesterday, the children of those people are, um, you know, it's, we've got to do everything we can to try to change the trajectory of where we're going. So I got a sister that teaches at St. Luke's and and one at Christ the King in Milwaukee, and they were, we were my daughter. Um, I just so you know, when I went to St. Luke's, there were 48 kids in each classroom. And they said, we can't deal with 16 today. How did that happen? Well, because Sister Blanche had that big ruler, and she'd pop you, and it kept it real good. But you're right. If you, if you just let them run wild, you can't accomplish anything in that setting. There were Whether, 80 kids in my dad's kindergarten class. 80? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we do really is important, actually, you know, from whether it's the SOAR program or, or uh, what we do at the LEAD program, what we're doing on home. I mean, it's, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, those, some of those kids who come in with serious uh, behavioral problems, their parents may have uh, interaction with the criminal justice system. Uh, they may have experience of homelessness. I mean, I, I think this is, I've been sort of mulling over how important Justices, you know, especially when you think of sort of all the scandals that we've seen over the last decade, whether it's with the church or whether it's with the government or whether it's with people in power um, in corporations. And uh, if you don't have justice, if people don't feel like um, you're going to give them what they're owed, you get all sorts of kind of ripple effects throughout your society that are really damaging, you know. And I think what we do, whether it's building roads, or, or managing our jail, 
or enforcing our laws. We're sort of the very beginning of justice. And if people feel like we're using their tax dollars to make sure their roads are, are good and safe, we're not wasting those tax dollars. If they feel like when they call 911, someone's just going to show up, or when someone's in the jail, they're going to, you know, the community's going to be safe. Um, that's the beginning of trust. That's the beginning of, of our society where you can get a, a kind of people building each other up and, and uh, working on some of these problems. I'm not going to go into the full extension of my logic here, but I'm going to tell you one, one of the things I've been thinking about and troubles with the world today. There is no truth. There is no reality. It's whatever you say it is. And, uh, and that's not how true. can that work? That's not true. Yeah. But, and regardless of what nonsense you see on TV or the Internet, people know. They know if they've been treated fairly or unfairly. I mean, we just had this presentation with the victims. You know, I've, I've, I've never met a victim of a crime who believed in subjective reality, you know? When, I, when someone hurts me, I know that's wrong. It's not just wrong because I didn't like it. It's wrong for everybody. It's wrong for the whole community, you know? And our system of justice is built on that. I mean, that's why the, the district attorney prosecutes for the state, prosecutes for all of us, because it's not just wrong for the individual. It's wrong for all of us. Um, so, yeah, regardless of the nonsense that can be out there, people know that's not true. All right, I'm done talking. So maybe we'll just have to wait and see what the new year, the new decade brings. But I just want you to know this a couple of years. I'll be watching you guys. <laughs> uh -huh. Just like Janet, I'll be sitting off somewhere, getting a couple licks in. You're not done while. yet. You got I know. Another, you got I another year of work ahead of you. Oh, but I'll just figure out well, taking a peek. Sam, you, you are a blessing to this board to this county to our employees uh, save it for and the end of no, the year <laughs> yeah 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 no you you have and i thank you for your um steady prodding of me for perfection and and always kind of saying hey you might want to think about this in a different way and uh in in, in uh, uh you know i just really appreciate you and and what has it been 16 years 16 so you're going to be in 17 is that i hope to what it'll be they could run me off at any time. I always say that. Right. 17 years in uh, your first year, right? Yeah. The completion of your first year. So you have it's, both it's spectrums. It's not done yet, but so far. Right. And here's what here's I tell people all the time. We have been blessed with Jan and John and a board that was three other people besides us two right here mm -hmm. that provided um, pretty steady leadership for Marion County and there's some changes going on and um, I I used to always say in the restaurant business give me the worst restaurant I'd like to take it over because you can only go up right in this case as the baton gets passed to Jan and to us as you go on and Sheriff you can relate to this it's you got to keep that baton like shiny because it's already shining and you can improve upon it but um, it's um, uh, you know, when like when Gloria left, and uh, we used to think, you know, our legal counsel, how great legal counsel we had, and 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 it was, but it's even gotten different and better in certain ways since uh, Jane's come. So I'm looking forward to the change. Change is always scary, but it's always an opportunity, and uh, I think the new decade is going to bring a lot of it. Change happens really fast, but having a young guy who can respond really quick. Versus us old people. Yeah. Wait, what are you? I told you you can't do that. We I said <laughs> us. I said us. I included me. I'm done. Uh, all right. Hit okay, that. Mr. Chair, do you want to read the calendar? Oh. Oh. I guess you know what. The last since one? next since next week, I will have to read the calendar. <laughs> well, it's up to the chair. You know, pre previous fair. previous chairs used to read the calendar, so I will with custom. I will read the the final year calendar. Okay, today we, uh, no, Jan, well, it doesn't even have today on here. Well, today we're done. No, don't we have something? You know, we have an executive session. Yes. Yeah, but it's not on here. So then it can't happen. So um, today we have an executive session at 11 o'clock, and I believe it is going to be in the, uh, the uh, Silverton. Silverton Conference Room upstairs. That's posted on our web, right? So tomorrow the office is closed in observance of New Year's Day, uh, January 1st, 2020. Uh, January 2nd, Thursday at 9.30 a.m., department head and elected officials meeting here in this building on the fifth floor in the commissioner's ballroom. 
boardroom. I needed to say that. <laughs> the first time I read the calendar when I got here, I, I said the commissioner's ballroom, and I always love to say that. It's in the commissioner's boardroom or ballroom. Come and dance. On uh, Monday, January 6th, in, at 8.30 a.m., a calendar review in the Silverton Conference Room here in this building on the fifth floor. Also on Monday, January 6th, 9 a.m., management update same Silverton Conference Room here on the fifth floor. Monday at 11 a.m. January 6th, Jobs Council meeting. Location is the Workforce Partnership Boardroom, uh, 626 High Street, Salem Suite 305. Tuesday, January 7th at 10 a.m. Work session, audit, FYI, 2018-19 financial statements here in the Silverton Conference Room in this building on the fifth floor. And then on Wednesday, we were back here for our board session on January 8th at 9 a.m. in the Senator hearing room. And then on Wednesday, 12 o'clock, we have the SEDCOR monthly business lunch located at Broadway Commons, 1300 Broadway Street, Northeast Salem. And as always, you can look at our website. Um, has anybody looked lately to make sure that's working? Because I know somebody told me it was this was like a month ago or so that it was hard to find our calendar or something. Yeah. I haven't looked lately, but yeah. Okay. We're adjourned. We will say Happy New Year. See you next year and next decade. We're adjourned.